Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 118. I'm here with Jackson Smith, um, his band director and chair of music department at Menasha High School in Wisconsin. Did I get that right? Yep, you got it. Yeah, you're number th- no, the third person from Wisconsin I've talked to. I was um, Chris Barons from Beloit I was with and uh, uh, Matthew Arau from uh, oh, yeah. Lawrence, I love Lawrence Ma- University. I love Matthew. Oh, he's a friend of mine. Um, we just did a clinic at, at Lawrence um, last, last March. They, it's an awesome place. What was it about? Oh, it was just um, our middle school bands, uh, seventh grade bands, did a day trip, and we did some clinics with their music ed students, and uh, Matthew then rehearsed the bands, and we did lunch on campus, and um, just, it was like a five-hour trip, but it was super awesome, and it it was the week before our concert, so it was perfect. Yeah. So, uh, so Jackson and I are hanging today because Jackson, like everybody else, like does it all at his school, right? You're the, you're the band director there doing everything from the nose flute ensemble to, to the jazz band to, to everything yeah, else. And that's right. Um, we were talking a lot about young percussionists and percussion gear and, and basically percussion for the non-percussionists today. Um, but first, can we start with the story about uh, your new school and what's so special about it? Yeah, I, uh, that's awesome. So I am brand new at my, at my new school. So Menasha High School, some of your listeners will recognize the city Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, we're right there. We're five minutes from Appleton, essentially. Um, and it is a, about a thousand kids at the high school and I am the, the director of bands at the high school. I am the only band director at the high school. Mm-hmm. My, I was previously in Pulaski, Wisconsin for five years and I've just taken this role, which I'm super excited about. Menasha High School, interestingly, it's one of the oldest, we think it's one of the oldest uh, public school band programs in the country. I've got some files and pictures, black and white pictures and news articles from the early 1920s. Mm. And um, that was a competitive street marching band at that time. Um, But it's just a really awesome, it's an awesome place. We've got great kids. Um, The interesting story is that in terms of gear and percussion and and working with students, if you are a non-percussionist, is that I'm the fourth band director at this high school in five years. And those years have come directly before COVID, during COVID, and now this wow. year. Wow. And so pre-COVID, and furthermore, it's a new high school principal and a new superintendent um, wow. who are both great. It sounds like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of problems, but um, I really love those two. And there seems to be a lot of support. But um, the point is that pre-COVID, we marched, I, I believe it was about 110 in a high school of 1,000, which is pretty good. Um, and now this year, well, last year they had seven students in the marching band, which is not really a marching band. It's more of like a marching ensemble. Um, but this year we've got 28 and we are trending up. I've been picking up kids left and right. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, but when I got my keys in June, the whole point that I reached out to you and said, this is kind of interesting is that none of the, my predecessors were, uh, percussionists and I don't blame them at all, but I don't think they really knew what we had or what is good and what is needing repair and, and all of that stuff. So I have spent three months working with my students and working individually to organize and sort out what needs to be what. And so I reached out to you and said, Hey, this is kind of interesting. Yeah. I've never heard this as a topic of percussion for the non-percussionist. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm excited to chat about it today. I love it. So one of the things I did a couple of years ago, we got a grant and uh, it was like 800 bucks or something. And we went to Lowe's and they basically donated a bunch of stuff and everything. And then I custom built like shelves. So like for all the storage in my band room, so one of the coolest things that I like is a cork board. I don't know if you've used a cork board before, but the ability yep. to have a big cork board and then like basically everything is hanging that, that can hang. Um, yep. There's so much great percussion stuff. I, you know, you're right. You don't have to be a percussionist to be an effective percussion teacher. Right. I, uh, we added um, two, uh, I guess I have pegboards. Do you have, is it a cork board? That's what board I meant. A, That's what I yeah. meant, a pegboard. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we added two pegboards. Um, like if the band room, there was a shelf, like a weirdly low shelf in the back by the percussion section, but no storage underneath. It was just a shelf. And so kids just put all of their stuff on it. You know, it just became a, 
catch, catch all, all and it yeah. yeah it was a mess so i had them take that out and then i had them mount two pegboards and so now our tambourines are hanging in our bass drum mallets and and it looks great you know it mm-hmm. looks neat and tidy and um and the kids uh were geeked out about it you know like oh, all their stuff was in the percussion cabinet we couldn't find anything and now it's all here yeah so yeah one thing, one a- thing that's cool about those shelves i have a shelf too a low shelf it's like maybe 16 inches off the ground, but it's one uh-huh. of those white metal wire shelves that you have in like in shelving in your closet at home. Oh yeah. So what's cool about it is like the mallets go through. So you can mm-hmm. like take all the extra mallets and like kind of line them up and kids can see them and stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's little stuff like that, right. When it comes to the storage. Yeah. So um, totally. let's, let's start taking about talking about uh, young percussionists. So, and we Great. say young in experience, not necessarily young students, but young in anything. Um, so you, you're you're a believer as I am that anybody can do this. Anybody can teach percussion. So right, yeah. yeah. And um, I I guess I I could have said off the top that I am not I'm not a uh, classically trained percussionist. I am uh, my all my classical training is in trombone performance. Um, and then I've from the age of ten I was a drum set player. I mm-hmm. played in various bands. You know, middle school talent show to. Um, festivals in where, up where I live for Packer games to um, playing in a cover band, a garage band in high school and playing in jazz in high school and college. And so by circumstance and necessity, I have now become a band director, but I've picked up and combined my drum set experience with my other, you know, techniques classes and all my other things. And then have by circumstance, I guess I've been the percussion instructor in my two districts so far. And so the message I'm hoping to share is that if you do not think of yourself as a percussionist, you can still be, like you said, a very effective percussion teacher. And it just takes a little, a little bit of effort and energy to learn mm-hmm. about what you've got and learn how to do it well. And then anyone can do it. Um, let me just speak briefly a little bit about my experience. Um, first yeah, of all, in, we- in Westbrook, we start kids on mallets. And then I believe, you know, as the literature comes in, then partway through that first year, at some point, they can start playing some snare drum and, and things like that. But we don't start 45 kids on snare drum. Um, and then also at the high school level, we're very fortunate. We have a separate percussion class for our lower band, right? So kids come in, we have a concert band and wind ensemble. And in the concert band, they either take the wind class or the percussion class. So it's just another, another section that was easy for the guidance department. Um, so with that, I have my, whatever it is, six to eight percussionists in that band and we literally have 75 minutes every other day where we can just do percussion stuff. I mean, That's you know, killer. so we can do the Garwood Whaley timpani methods, you know, like we just did a test mm-hmm. a couple of days ago and we had staying alive going on at the same time and like just help them keep steady beat. Right. Um, yeah. So whether it's like mallet technique or you're dealing with um, snare pads, you know, like what, what is it? The Tommy Igo warm up and syncopation, you know, reading, like you can do all the percussion things, when you're right. able to have that, that class. So I treat it very differently bec- because of that. Yeah. I think you, you've, you've touched on, and you're very fortunate. Um, sounds like in your district that mm-hmm. you're, um, got the support and, and the ability to create that section. So I, can you explain relative to that every other day, is mm-hmm. that opposite your large ensemble? So it's the percussionists are double dipping or is it, nope. how is that done nope it's that's their band class they don't meet with the wind players oh, um wow. we do and because of that i mean this is our lower band so we're not usually past the grade three level sometimes okay. we'll reach a four but usually it's like two and a half three three and a half so i have to choose a lot of lit that i know i can do a plus b you know okay. if it's right. super integral then that's a harder piece to do um you know i will get them in for a couple of rehearsals and at least especially a dress rehearsal beforehand but usually I find that if the percussion section that I have has rehearsed, they've learned the parts and they've rehearsed with the recording. You know, we have like big speaker mm-hmm. on there kind of, so they know the wind parts. Yep. Um, and then vice versa too. The R or wind section will hear the full recordings a couple of times so that they have an idea about who we're listening to. And I'll have them write in, okay, in measure 48, write in triangle because that's who we're following or write in mm-hmm. timpani or, or whatever mm-hmm. it is. So yeah, it's worked so well for us. It, I mean, it's definitely not perfect. I'd rather they had both. But I'd right, rather right. them have the time to really develop because then when they're ready, they move to our older group, the wind ensemble, and they're back in the full band and they, they mm-hmm. can function so much better. So so are they coming from the middle school? Are they coming yep. from a full ensemble uh, situation? Yep. Yeah, my wife um, is a fantastic middle school teacher and she teaches all the middle school kids and, and they have a full band period, but they have a chance to like do some pull-out sectionals most of the time. 
So they definitely have shorter sectionals than that, but not, you sure. know, it's, it's mainly full band. Yeah. I think that's really the ticket, regardless of how you do it and how your building schedule looks or when you can get the kids is the percussionist. Cause there's so much to know when you are, mm-hmm. you know, before, before you hit that um, advanced group, or even still, when you hit that advanced group, you're a junior or senior in high school, or whatever, uh, they do need that individual attention. So whether if it's um, middle school level, you've got a, a sectional. Uh, my previous district, they were um, once a week during their recess time, once they hit seventh and eighth grade band. Um, and then sixth grade, the sixth grade classes were team taught. So they, uh, we had, you know, one teacher would take the percussionist, one teacher would take the flutes, and then occasionally we'd combine and do some reading and some exercises. But it was mostly um, it was mostly separate instruction. And that worked really well because you can dip into those technique books and um, really really work slowly in what they need to know so that when they're back in a, a real situation, if you want to call it, they're, they're ready to cook. They can function, yeah. Um, right. So I try to divide my time into four basic things in that percussion class i usually deal with like timpani and then pad work all the snare drum stuff um and then mallet time and then sort of ensemble stuff now i can't squeeze everything in every day and that obviously doesn't deal with all the auxiliary stuff we yeah. usually do a unit where we're where we're learning like multiple percussion etudes and things like that and that's mm-hmm. that's where we'll all play tambourine and, and whatever you know I, i've had as many as like 10 kids in this class and we're literally all playing timpani at the same time, right? Yeah, so, that's great. Like you, like everybody gets in a crack, and then we basically have extra pads set up, so like they're playing too, but they're dampening just like they're on a pad, and I mean mm-hmm. they're on a timpani and mm-hmm. um, and all that. Or we're all playing crack cymbals. We might have six pair, but they're seven kids. Well, the seventh kid is like literally playing. You know, they have their hands and they're they're playing. Right. You know, right. just like they have it. It's like a mental thing as as much as anything. It totally, it totally is. Yeah, it it's totally so funny is. the amount the amount of times we finished a timpani piece, and it's like. Whole note, one, two, three, four. Dampen. You know, they have to say dampen at the end or else they don't remember right. to do it. Um, That's so, right. Um, in mallet stuff, we do a lot of like reading technique stuff. Um, but it's the biggest thing to me because so many kids, you know, are like not mallet players in air quotes. Uh, right. Um, so, yes, and that reminds me of something. Finish what you're saying and then I want to, I've got something here. Okay. So the my huge my huge thing that I learned a bunch of years, years ago that helps kids like mallets is I then will do some custom duet, trio, quartet arrangements just for mallet instruments mm. that are that are all based on pop tunes. So oh, they're playing nice. like what what makes you beautiful or I won't give up or you know whatever easy tune and you can write it so that it's like two mallet or three mallet like make it super playable. Right. Um, you can have I've done it in four part where like the bass clef is the bottom part. So like kids are your advanced kid is like reading the bass clef part or whatever awesome. you need to do. So the pop like music on, thing on to Marimba me is, or something. Yeah. The, the pop music thing to me is huge to get a lot of those kids to buy into mallets. Yeah. That's, that's cool. I haven't thought of, I hadn't heard about that, but that's a great idea. Um, the thing I was going to say when you said some, some kids are not mallet players or mm-hmm. some kids are not whatever, you know, they percussionists, they, they do, they're like creatures of habit. They pick their lane and then they, they want to stick into it and you have to sort of gently wean yeah. them into another track. Um, I think that is a critical thing in in terms of your uh, your setup and your um, your tradition or whatever you want to call it within your percussion section is to start them as soon as you get them going in sixth grade or fifth grade or whenever you start that everyone will learn everything mm-hmm. and um, it's critical that the the, the the sentence that I say is that good percussionists play it all and and I have currently a class of um, of high schoolers that I've just uh, gotten as my new students here in Menasha mm-hmm. and they are really stuck in their lane. And mm-hmm. so that's going to be my, um, that's going to be my, my goal is to train them and, and wean them off. But we have a flex hour in the day. It's a ha- well, it's a half an hour flexible time where I'm able to pull a sectional together and we can start doing some of that much needed work on maybe for some of them, this is a timpani mm-hmm. and, Mm-hmm. This is uh, how you operate it, and um, this is how you put it away. And or you know, what are these various mallet instruments? I've never played mallets because I always play bass drum. Well, mm-hmm. not anymore. <laughs> Everyone right. is going to learn everything. 
Yeah. And they have to find some success on it. Right. I mean, yes. and it is natural. And every percussionist I've talked to says this, there are kids who are going to always in their mind kind of be mallet players, but they have right. to be, they have to be functional on everything. Even mm-hmm. they can still have a lane, but they need to like be able to change lanes. Right. Yeah. Right. Your former piano, it's always a former piano players for me. That's right. That they, the mallets are easy and, and everybody else thinks mallets are hard. And so they, they feel cool mm-hmm. <laughs> that they can play really well and they can read. One thing I've done, again, I have the luxury of having that class, but like, yeah. uh, you know, if you do a piece like um, Bach, Prelude, and Fugue in B-flat major, like a great piece that has just a timpani part. I did that one year and I had like eight new percussionists. I'm like, okay, Ooh. fine. So, well, literally, I just wrote a part that fits the harmony of the, of the chords and yeah. it's all like F in the right hand, B-flat in the left hand, like whole notes. Yep. And then G in the left hand, B-flat in the right hand. You know, like you make it super simple um, yep. and you can do like an easy part, a harder part and things like that. And you know, just giving them plenty to do and making sure they're rhythmically challenged. I right. think it's really big or they're going to cause problems. Yes, they are. Absolutely. They just are. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's start talking gear. Um, so was it Ooh, 2022? Wait, oh, hold on a sec. Can I, yeah. uh, can I say one more thing? Just a plug on, um, on a really great methods book for young, young percussionists, like beginner to yeah, yeah, yeah. second year. Yep. Um, it's the Steve Graves method. I don't know if you, do you know Steve Graves? Um, I know the name. I don't know him, but he's, that's the book that we used um, in Pulaski. Uh, my my colleague Colleen Marler recommended it, and it's great. So the the book is called Drums, Keyboards, and More yep. by Steve Graves, and it does kind of what we're talking about. But it is a curriculum that can be followed at individual percussion class or just a lesson structure that takes kids through. This is this. What are the th- important things to know? Let's play a little easy thing. Now let's go back and combine with the other thing. It's just mm-hmm. laid out really well. So His, um, I don't know. I don't know Steve. He doesn't endorse me or whatever, but yeah. um, we used it, and I think it's really a wonderful method. Is it a book that's for percussion classes, or can be used in conjunction? Uh, I think it's just for separate percussion instruction. I yeah. don't know that it has a companion method for wins. I doubt it. But it could be. Um, you know, it could be one on one. It could be like with one kid or yeah, uh, right, or a class. yeah. Right. It could. Um, I think it's, you know, if you've got the, if you've got the, you know, if you've got seven tambourines enough to, for every kid, mm-hmm. then you obviously, you know, have yeah. them all work at the same time. But you can do it for those watching. You take your left hand out like this and then you take your right hand and you're like, that's you play right. it and you shake it, you know, I right. mean, that's you right. Can... <laughs> the invisible tambourine. Yeah. You can make <laughs> stuff up. That's great. Um, okay. So, um, 2022, you started, uh, your company Smith percussion services. What was that yeah. all about? I wouldn't even call it a company. It was, uh, okay. I mean, it's, it, I guess it's a company. I paid taxes on it, but, um, it's a company. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it was just, a kind of an, a hobby. Um, so when I was new in my previous district, uh, in Pulaski, we had what we called the scary cabinets. And some of you may have the scary percussion cabinets full of, um, broken pieces and, um, toppers to stands and, you know, dust and old symbols that you, that the, they're so old that you can't see the markings anymore. And, you know, just, or snare drums that are are missing a snare strainer or whatever it is, cabinets full of junk, basically. And we had two of them and I took it upon myself to meticulously go through the cabinets and sort out what was good and what was not. And most of it was not, but, um, we did find a seventies Ludwig maple field drum that just needed new heads. Beautiful. Cool. Um, and we found, um, like a sixties copper over brass Slingerland 10 lug concert snare Mm. that it needed, it needed work, needed a new strainer. I had to find that original piece. And, but it's a, you know, we, we found a lot of good stuff, um, and got rid of a lot of junk and, um, made room for much needed storage and all that sort of stuff. So I did that process and it was just part of my job as the percussion instructor, someone who was knowledgeable about Mm -hmm. this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, Eventually we looked around and I had gone through the entire inventory and I had serviced the timpani and we got new heads on that. And, um, you know, we, I researched and ordered us a new drum set. So I went through the whole program and now that program's got basically everything they need for the size. Um, and one of my colleagues looked at me one day and said, you should do this as a job. You know, you, this, this is a service that people could use. Mm-hmm. Um, because she, she just said, I would not know where to even start with this and you do. And I'm just letting you do it. 
So I put some feelers out there about exactly that. Who has got scary closets full of stuff or who just needs maintenance done and doesn't have time or the, or the knowledge to do it. And I had a couple schools uh, in Wisconsin hit me up. And so I serviced um, two high schools and a college and I, I offered like a free consultation. I would just go there and, you know, render an opinion, I guess, mm -hmm. on <laughs> what mm -hmm. you've got and what you need. And, uh, then if you need any maintenance done, I do that too. So uh, that went really well. And, um, what I learned from it is that again, I'm not a percussionist, but I just can do research and, and, um, work with the resources that I've got and, and it's, it's doable. So, um, I think it was valuable. I no longer have time to, to do it with my new position because I've mm -hmm. got a whole school's worth of stuff to do here. Sure. But, um, yeah, uh, it was cool. And I'll, I'll just say, um, if anybody just does, you just do a Google search of an image of percussion storage, you can find so many cool ideas mm -hmm. and then find somebody who can build it. Like when I built our cabinet, like all of our symbols go into these like wooden sleeve, like vertical. So you can see all your symbols rather than Perfect. having them stuck somewhere. Um, anyway, and we're going to provide this, whether you're watching it on YouTube or listening to the podcast, there'll be the link down below in the show notes. Um, you have two documents that, that, uh, are going to be available for people. Um, one is their band program equipment assessment template, which basically you, seems like you have listed basically, you know, everything that you would tend to need or want. Right. Um, and it's, it is broken down by level yep. in it's, it's some of it is an, uh, a must have like obviously two good functioning concert snare drums with it should be different depths and, and ideally different materials. And, obviously a, a, at least one functioning bass drum concert bass drum I, like there's standard things but then there's some wish list things like if you're going to program some john Mackey and you uh you need some of these different toys and and cool things mm -hmm. at a high school level you know this is a list that you can look and just go through and yep i've got that i've got that Ooh, what is that thing i should google it and find out what it is and maybe i could maybe i've got some pieces in my library that i haven't ever programmed because I don't own, um, I even know what's an example, Cortales. An ice you know? bell. You know. yeah, yeah, right. Or yeah, something really odd. Um, yeah, and sometimes they're not even that expensive. No, no. Yeah. Some of the, uh, that aux stuff is very affordable, but you yeah. have to have a reason to have it. Yeah. Um, and then the other piece of paper is what you call your one sheet. Yeah, it's not really a, it's not really one sheet. It's, it's a, a one and sheet, half sheet. And sheet and a <laughs> half. Um, but the, the term one sheet, I have heard, I think it was this podcast that we I've heard one sheet used before. Okay. Maybe. Um, just like when you're working on a piece of music and it's a sheet with um, common rhythms and. Oh, uh, like a companion guide. Yeah. Like a yeah, companion yeah. guide. Yeah. So, one sheet. Okay. So we, I call it a one sheet. Um, yep. I, I make them for my middle school if I don't have them because mm -hmm. it help, you learn the piece twice as fast. If, if you've got something. Like I'm totally that. in the middle of that right now. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So if, if, um, do we want to talk briefly about what that is in case people don't know what we're talking about? Or? The one sheet, like the companion guide or yours? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Like just a general. You can go ahead and explain maybe. Yeah, so so I call it companion guide or a one sheet. Basically, you take a piece of music and you basically circle, what do I think my kids need to work on to do this piece? So for me, I'm doing it on St. Petersburg March, and I chose the first and second theme. And I actually literally put on this one the first, the melody, the harmony, the accompaniment and the bass line for everybody. So then we could like learn all four parts, let them choose, make an ensemble. And then they obviously learn the piece so much faster. And then we did the same thing with the second theme. Sometimes you just go, okay, here's the stuff these sections need to work on. Like if this is a flute part that my flutes will be able to play, I usually don't put it on the companion guide or the one sheet. But if it's something I know my kids are going to need help with, if you have it all on one sheet of paper, front and back or whatever, and hand it to them, you can always refer to it. Right. Yeah. I made, um, I've made, I've made probably 10. Yeah. I haven't been teaching for that long, but I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've made 10 that have been really successful. And, um, it, it can also take, it can be really, be really great when you're working with, um, you've chosen a piece of music to specifically work on a new rhythmic concept. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, uh, working on dotted quarter eighth or dotted eight sixteenth. Um, and you can work that into a comprehensive lesson about this rhythmic concept. And so then it's taken out of the context and it's easier to digest. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes back into the context, they've got it without Completely. having to stop the rehearsal and, and, you know, be frustrated about, we just worked on this, mm -hmm. you know, 20 minutes ago on the board. Why can't you do it? Well, provide the, 
Anyways, that's yeah. we're getting we're straying off topic. Yeah, that's no, a that, that's okay. But well, I just wrote down on my notes. You have those like still available? The ones that I've made. The ones that you made. The ones that you uh, made. Yeah, I do. I'd have to dig them out of my Google Drive. Um, well, if you have them, if you share yeah. them with me, yeah, um, I have a little list going, and I'll put yours in the ones that mine, and I'll put that on the show notes too. Oh, great! So if yeah, anybody wants that. to access all the great work you have done, we can okay. include that. Yeah. Sure. And I and I I do want to I'll name drop just briefly. I do not want to take credit as a as a sole individual. My I am a sole band director now, but my last five years have been working with a great team. Sure. Um Colleen Marler and uh, Michelle Henslin and Tim Kozlowski at in Pulaski, Wisconsin, um have work I've worked closely with them on a lots of this stuff. So right. um you know it's a group it, it, when you we have a when you have a group, it's a real group effort and, and you I want to make sure that they get some credit for some of this stuff too. Wonderful. Um, so on the one sheet, you basically have the you know buy nice or buy twice, and you have all oh, these right. great all these great brands of all the things. So yeah, you don't need to be a member to see this stuff. So it's going to be on there. Um, you've got some links on you know um, YouTube videos and like Care Guide for Ludwig and Timpani and all that sort of stuff. So I'll urge rather than us going all the way through that, I'll urge people to kind of click on that and check it, take it out and and figure uh, what works best for you. Yeah, it would take it would take somebody fifteen minutes to go through it, and then just stand in your band room and go, "Hmm, yeah, I have that," or uh, "Not really. That's not really in effect," you know. Yeah. And um, I would just encourage people who uh, aren't percussion specialists or don't feel like they've got a good handle on what's going on to check it out and um, just use it as a reference. Because and and it, uh, I should also say it's not comprehensive. Sure, um, I'm sure I'm missing stuff. But um, I think it's a great starting point for getting yourself in order with your with your percussion gear. So we were batting back and forth the idea of actually having Jackson walk us through like audio, how to actually change a snare drum head and strainer and all that. But you were probably wise in saying, you know, everything you want to do for percussion maintenance can be found in very short YouTube videos. Right. Yeah. And and to be honest with you, if you're if you're handy at all, which most band teachers are all all it needs is a two minute you know youtube view you just search how to change how to replace a snare drum strainer or how mm -hmm. to line up a snare drum how to line up snares or how to tune congas i mean whatever you need there's there's really good youtube is an amazing resource um sure is certainly for this but there's all of that's out there and yeah i i could struggle to to explain how to do mm -hmm. these things but visual this stuff is so visual that i think yep. that that part is really important so That's i encourage smart. anybody instead of just and i i do see this and i saw this when i went and serviced service some of those schools and even my own two schools here that a lot of times something will break or need uh, a part replaced and instead of getting that part replaced or or doing that service which may only take an hour once you really get down to it or even less um it just gets put on a shelf or it gets put into storage and it doesn't get used anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's really too bad because it's not, it's not a, some foreign language. It's just neat. You know, it's just a new thing about, about being a band teacher for yeah. you if you're not a percussionist. Yeah. And most of the time you have a percussionist or at least a band kid who's super handy, who's going to be a future mechanic. You oh, know? Oh, right. and a lot of times putting kids in charge of stuff like that on their own, you know, is yes. really helpful. You know, a kid who's in charge of that. Um, yeah, one of the things smart thing you do is you talk about scheduling a maintenance day for your students. That's a fun and unique learning opportunity. So instead of doing percussion that day, you're dealing with maintaining gear. So how do you do that? Yeah, or you can even make it. You can even make it more of a party, like on a Saturday afternoon or something. Um, you order pizza for everybody, and then instead of you re replacing all of the heads on your drum line or hiring someone to do it, you can simultaneously you can order the heads, obviously, but then. Um, you do one ahead of time. So you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then have your percussionists who are interested or even any band kids who are interested, uh, come in and learn how to do this properly. And suddenly you've got 10, uh, sets of hands doing this work and you can do the whole drum line in, you know, two hours or three hours. And then the fine tuning can be done by your, uh, percussionist, uh, percussion teacher or yourself or, or a drumline captain or whoever will will do the the fine tuning um but the actual um 
physical labor that goes into some of that is really tough. And kids think that's super cool, especially younger kids, like eighth graders, freshmen, because mm-hmm. it's usually something that they haven't done. Maybe they own a drum set at home, sure, but it's just got heads on it, and they've never had to or thought about replacing them. Um, and now they will know how, and you can open up a ton of cool conversations about my drum set sounds like a cardboard box. You know, why, what can I do? Mm-hmm. Remember when you came in for that drum line maintenance day and we replaced the heads on the, the marching basses? Well, let's look at some drum heads and you can sp- ask your parents for your birthday for new heads and you'll, uh, you'll go from a cardboard box drum set to, a really nice sounding drum set, uh, in, in an afternoon. Yep. Um, and I've had great success with that. I, I did it first with a personal drum set of mine. I was going to do the work myself, but I thought this is kind of cool. I could have some kids come in and I can show them how to do it. And then since then I've done it with, um, our drumline gear at the middle school. Um, I did it with our uh, new gear at the high school. Um, it's just been really great and kids love it. So I encourage you, I encourage you to do that. If you're going to look to do that kind of service. Love it. it. Love it. You also say a poorly functioning timpani are useless. Well-maintained ones are an asset. Yeah, we've all seen the timpani that don't work. And then sometimes oh, they're yeah. easy enough to do, but like sometimes you get a really old set or it's it's hard to do that. So so like, right. yeah. Are there certain timpani that are like beyond, you know, most repair? Or is it literally every, just about every set of timpani could be rehauled? Um, you know, I don't know. And okay. that I think that comes down to me not being a real percussion um, like technician, I guess I'm, I'm, I would call myself a specialist, but not a technician. So, um, someone who is a percussion repair tech in a large music store might be able to answer that question better. I've, I've worked on four set, four or five sets of timpani in, um, in my time. And they've all been either the Ludwig, um, fiberglass or Yamaha brass shell. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have yet to encounter one that, that didn't, uh, wasn't, serviceable some are really far out and you need to slowly tighten the springs and then let them sit for a week and then come back and do it again and so you don't crack uh, a spring or you don't crack the little tension rods on those fiberglass timpani but um all of that information i didn't know any of it and Mm -hmm. when it came down to servicing our timpani at our middle school a few years ago in pulaski i watched a bunch of youtube videos probably spent an hour watching videos and then I ordered the things that I needed and I set them in the back room and oh, did it over the summer. And it, it took me probably a, a day, you know, but mm-hmm. that timpani sounds great right now. The, yeah. the pedals move smooth. The heads are, are beautiful new heads and, and the kids love playing the timpani now because they sound great mm-hmm. and they function correctly Yeah, and it elevates the ensemble. So yeah, if your timpani's out of order, um, I would really encourage you to get it back in order fast because it will, it will be a huge asset to your program as opposed to be kind of a waste of space. Yeah. And sometimes when you have to repair a percussion thing, like it's, it's a general item that you can get anywhere. For example, I'm thinking about fishing line. If you're doing, Mm -hmm. dealing with, um, triangles, right. Using fishing line instead of a string. Um, and then when you want to restring a marimba or something like going to the army Navy store and getting what it's called paracord, like mm-hmm. paracord that's that's skinny enough to to go through. You know, there's stuff that you can get and then literally just do it yourself or with kids. And right. Um yeah, YouTube is a wonderful place. When I do ev- every tension rod that I do, I put white lithium grease on them. Mm-hmm. And that's like from Home Depot. You know, it's not it's not some special thing. Sure. It's just yeah, a, lo- a lot of it is trips to Menards or whatever and uh you <laughs> you save your receipt and you've got $24.95 worth of um, things, but then now you've got four more functional pieces of equipment for your program. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in general, the repair versus replacement, you know, sort of what's your philosophy with that? Yeah. Um, This is where it helps to have a knowledgeable person uh, kind of render an opinion. If you're not, Um, I think that we did kind of make a list of, um, I'm cheating. I'm looking at my notes here, but we did kind of make a list of things that would be now it's time to replace. Yep. Um, so on a, on any drum shell, if you've got a major crack, um, Mm -hmm. or if you've got warping to a drum shell, um, or dents in a metal shell, 
Um, and if, if you're in a major city and you have a really valuable metal shell drum, like a bell brass snare or um, a hand hammered bronze shell or something, you're in a major city with a really good percussion repair tech, then you could get that um, repl- uh, you can get that fixed. But that's usually if you've got like the, the thing I think of is um, Ludwig Acrylites is that you see them all over the place because they were a student snare drum in student kits for like mm-hmm. 30 years. They're that gray um, Ludwig eight sure. lug snare yep. drum. And they've, some of them are um, pebbled like a, it's called an orange something coating, but they've got a pebbled surface or it's a smooth um, with a bead in the center of the shell. Um, those are great drums, uh, but they're aluminum and they're really prone to denting and, and warping. If they get dropped once, they kind of get smashed in. Yep. Um, so those are hard to, hard to recover, usually I, not worth doing. Yeah, I, I do want to mention there's a difference between the shell and the rim, right? Because if you have a rim yes. that's scented, the rim, you can just buy a new rim. Like we just had lots right. of times with your bass drum, you're marching bass drums, you do all the, the rim knocks and everything. If you don't have a rim guard on that, you know, in 10 mm-hmm. years, you got to replace it and whatever. But, you know, right. a rim is different from a shell. Yeah. So um, if you've got dented or warped shells, um, typically it's time to go. Um, If you've got damaged bearing edges, so the bearing edge on a drum, if you don't know, is once you take the head off, it is the the lip of the drum that's um, got an angle to it that the Mm -hmm. head sits on that that edge or that rim or that lip, whatever you want to call it, but it's called the bearing edge. And if I don't even know how this would happen. It would have to have happened by real abuse, but sometimes you take heads off of drums and there's cracks or chips in the bearing edge Mm -hmm. and then it won't, it won't resonate the right way anymore. Sure. It will still sound like a drum, but usually that's not repairable unless it's some very valuable, um, kind of piece, then maybe look at it. But, um, so that's, that's a time to retire. And then if you've got, um, this is kind of a safety thing for kids. If you've got, um, older uh you've got vintage equipment that had a um a chrome coating or um aluminum drum that's got like a steel plate on the aluminum sometimes it flakes and it chips and it can be really sharp and um there's a way to sandblast that off but you know again if you've got those sort of drums, it's time for those to go because if you have a kid accidentally grab it with their open hand, now you've got little flakes of chrome in their hand. Yep. That's really a problem. So um, you do see that. Um, I saw we had a ton of them in our, in our when I went through Menasha's gear, and we just got rid of them. Yep. because they were no longer good for kids. But I, so that's that's go ahead, sorry. I, yeah, no, I had I had a brain wandering moment. I don't know why. I was just like maybe it's the trumpet player in me, but you're talking and I'm like I you talk about like re reusing or recycling or re- resourcing something. About 6 years ago I wanted to do um fantasy on a Japanese folk song by Sam Hazo and there's like this taiko yeah. drum part. Yeah. Right? Well like to buy a taiko drum, like a real one, it's like not mm-hmm. going to not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we're talking like thousands and thousands for like a real one. So mm-hmm. I found on YouTube, this, this guy is like, Hey, here's how you make a taiko drum. So I did it. And the thing sounds great. I mean, it's probably not like a real taiko drum, but it's just yeah. big bassy sound. All you do is get an old tire and like four packages of packing tape. And you literally awesome. like wrap it around, yeah. like slowly rotating until it's like literally this, com- this covered thing in, in, and you can play them and it almost sounds like a big deep bass drum. And it's That's like awesome. basically free. You know, I went to yeah. the, the closet at the, uh, um, at the secretary's office and got like a bunch of tape. And then I went to the, the, the hardware store and like, hey, you got an old tire? And they gave it to me. And yeah, so stuff like that's fun. That's cool. Yeah, we, I, I, kept, I kept stuff around a lot for, um, for non, essentially non-Western um, derived yep. music. Uh, and you, you do need odd sounds or different depths and and timbres of drums a lot for different stuff and kids love that kind of music Mm -hmm. um and in my previous district we had an old ludwig bass drum that kind of had like the mounts were stripped out and they were like can we get rid of this and i said no let's just put it up on the shelf and eventually we did need i don't know what the piece called for it was terracotta warriors which is kind of a Mm great two and a half yeah but it um it calls for like a second um tribal drum sort of sound and so we ratcheted the head on one side up super tight took the other head off and all of a sudden we had this perfect sound that we needed yeah um so cool so that's that so in terms of um repair i would say that most things really can be repaired 
um, if you're willing to put the the resources to it and and um, refurbishing or rebuilding good high quality equipment is certainly less expensive than buying something brand new. Yeah. Um, especially if you can even get a hold of it. Like if you're trying to buy Yamaha gear right now in the U S good luck. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a year wait on a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So um, if you do have but, a limited budget with mo- which most of us do, you know, yeah. like w- what are the best, the best places you say to spend that money? Um, you said public facing pieces first, like drumline service concert percussion. Right. So I I think this is really important. I heard, um, who's your friend, um, uh, Jeff, right? That is your other co-host sometimes. Jeff Smith. Yep. Yeah. I heard him on a really early episode say, talk about how it's important for the band to be out in the community and be seen visually. Yeah. Positive, um, performances or, or whatever it is. Um, and so going along with that, is all of your gear and all of your instruments and uh, drum line specifically is so primal and people who are not musicians are not percussionists, but certainly are not musicians, or maybe don't even have a kid in the program. They do understand drum line and mm-hmm. they, they think it's cool and they think it's, they somehow it's, it talks to their like inner human programming. So, um, if you've got a limited budget, and everything else is is kind of in working order, and you have maybe some opportunity to spend some money. I would get that drum line looking and sounding good as your first step. Yeah, um, and some, sometimes too, you're asked for a last minute. Hey, can the marching man come to CVS and play the yes. Halloween parade? And you're like, sometimes you can do it, and sometimes you can't. But you can right. send a drum line, and if they mm-hmm. know a couple of riffs or part of their show or the cadence, and people think mm-hmm. the band's there when it's like ten kids, right, or whatever it is. Yeah, totally. If you have um, high quality gear. Uh, like say you've got a Yamaha line that is mm, 10 years old and the rims, like you were saying, are all chipped up from the rim knocks and your heads are, you know, three years old and they don't sound great anymore. And, um, your harnesses are, you know, totally ratty instead of buying all new gear. If you had a limited budget, you could instead buy new heads, new rims, new harnesses as needed and you could get new wraps to totally. match your school colors. And you could, instead of spending 15 grand on a new line, you've spent three or four. And mm-hmm. you've got a new looking and new sounding line that would would go another five to seven years. And you'd get you'd get a lot of gain a lot of ground doing that. Brilliant. Um, there's a site, I think it's called um one two wraps, on two wraps, something like that. But um I'm looking at them to to do for our line here actually yep. um because our drums are black but our school colors are blue and so it looks okay because black's neutral but it'd be great if we had sparkly blue drums sure so yeah, yeah i would do public facing pieces first and then um get your your main your main uh concert percussion pieces like your uh you should have two functioning concert snare drums certainly at the high school level uh Ideally, a metal drum and a wood drum, and ideally in two different depths, five and a half inches, uh, or five inches, or five and a half, or six and a half, or eight, if you've got a really nice, like, eight-inch deep maple drum, that would be really nice. Um, but I get that. I would do new heads on on those and make sure your concert bass drum is um, got nice heads and your timpani. Yep. After that, um, everything else is kind of, can be on a next tier. You know, it's not superficial, sure. but... Yeah, that's what sure. I would do. And then um, I've got just a little note that says upgrade your cymbals. Um, an intermediate drum set with with good condition heads, but with really nice cymbals sounds great. Sure does. Um, as opposed to having kind of cheapo or intermediate cymbals with a really nice drum set, it doesn't it doesn't sound the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would, I would, if you're looking at new, new drum set or, or, or doing something with your drum set or, or your concert crash cymbals or whatever, I, I would look to do those cymbals before you buy all new drums. Yeah. Um, and you know, but, I, w- I was thinking about a lot of times we have drummers who are like, they start as rock drummers and then they learn jazz drum set. Right. Because, yeah. you know, you're the expert, not me, but you know, rock is mainly about the drums and jazz is starts more about the cymbals. So yep. those kids have to get used to, what that feels like to play on the cymbals more than they play the drums. Yeah. I was one of those kids, by the way. Um, yeah, I start, I, um, 
my buddy said in, in seventh grade, we were in a band already. I was the singer and he was the guitar player. And then the kid who was playing drums dropped out. And, uh, he said, well, we got to play for the middle school talent show. So you want to play drums? I'm like, I guess, I don't know how to play drums. I play trombone. Is that any good? He went, no, that's no good. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Yeah, we had a real, real crap drum set and really bad cymbals, but it was fun. Yeah. Cool. Um, I wanted to mention, too, there's a great company that um, I've used for a long time called Tap Space. That's one word, Tap Space. They're out of California. And you can go on if you're looking for percussion ensemble music. You know, you can filter it by, I've got four players at the easy level. And you can see scores. You can hear recordings. And a lot of times on YouTube, you can watch people perform them, too. So Tap Space is a great thing to, uh, you know, buy three or four of the pieces and see which one works best for your kids. Um, I've had a lot of a lot of a lot of luck with Tap Space, and now when you buy them, everything's download too. So once you buy it, you just have the the, the PDFs and all that. So that's um, awesome. Yeah. So hey, Jackson, can I say one more thing about this limited budget? Yeah, do it. So I think, and and I'm I'm work I'm looking at this right now with my new admin in Manasha. Yeah. Um, is when when you're faced with needing lots of stuff, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you do? And administrators really love it when you come to the table to those discussions instead of just asking, I need all this stuff. Can I have $48,000? They'll go, "Mm, no. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you can combine forces with your other support networks like a parent group or um, community groups um, to, you know, make a shared investment plan for a large purchase your administration will be much more inclined to do that. So we have a plan going, a soft plan going in Manasha to probably try to split some costs um, with uh, local businesses or and and with um, the admin and a parent group. So we're not one group is not, or the school is not having to face the full cost to get whatever you need. Yep. And you could do it over multiple years. You can say, hey, over the next five years, let's spread, right. spread this out kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It works with trips too. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're able to, you know, have a parent group donate um, $100 for every student going on the trip and do a fundraising campaign, then you've got local businesses that will, that will match it. And then um, kids can do fundraising within your program. Suddenly, every kid's got $300 already for their trip. And then... Uh, the band budget might pick up a little bit. So that's sort of combining combining elements can be really effective. Yeah, when it comes to large purchases too, people understand the 10-year plan, the 20-year plan, like because they deal with photocopiers, right? So it's like, right. you know, we know that every few years photocopiers have to be done. So if you talk to them about, hey, I've got $100,000 worth of stuff here, you know, every 10 years we should be spending 10 grand, you know, to, to keep things going or whatever it is. So keep speaking the copier budget um, language right. really usually works for people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Cool. Great. So Jackson, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, best way to do that is, uh, just with my email. Uh, should I give my personal or my school? What, what is best? Man, it's up to you. Well, I can give my personal email. Um, and if I, I would, I would love it actually, it would just be fun for me if someone is listening and goes, Oh my gosh, I have the scary closet. He talked about the closet mm-hmm. full of stuff and you want to, throw me on a zoom call and I would just, you know, if whatever you're in Oklahoma or wherever you are, I'd be Love happy it. to happy to look at it and just give my, give my uh, little opinion about generally what, <laughs> what you need to do. Yeah. Um, but my, uh, my personal email is my name, Jackson, the letter P and then my last name, Smith at me.com. Like it's me. So J A C K S O N P S M I T H at M E.com. Awesome. It's uh it's been really fun. It's it's always nice to hang with another Smith band director. There's not enough. Yeah, of us in the I know. World. I I thought about that this morning. I yeah. was like another Smith is going to be on this podcast. That's right. It's good. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. 